Good morning. It's so good to be here with all of you. Uh, I imagine there's probably some teen women out there somewhere, some college students, some amazing single professional women, uh, some young moms that are probably the most tired of all of us, and more women that are my age. <laughs> um, probably. <laughs> um, I bring greetings from the church in Charleston. We are so grateful for this church. You guys have always been like a big sister to us that we could always count on. And we love the Columbia Church. And um, I want to give one small disclaimer. I cough sometimes. I am not sick. I just want to reassure you. I have allergies that cause me to cough. And actually one time, I went to a doctor about it, and he told me not to talk as much. I was like, that's what I do for a living. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I guess I just carry lots of halls with me. But if you can bring up the first slide, um, I fell in love with my sweetheart here. That's back when, some of you might remember that, um, when I had lots of hair and Ivy's hair was still brown. <laughs> so... Um, a few weeks ago, that's us now, and a few weeks we will celebrate 34 years of marriage. So we are very, very grateful to God uh, for the way that he's put so many people in our lives over the years to help us get to this place. Uh, he went to USC to college, and then later our son Tyler did as well, and I'm sure some of you remember Tyler when he was here. So, and then the next slide, that's my crew. Um, it's actually a couple years ago, we were at a fancy wedding in Chicago. So, but that's my, my crew and Tyler and my daughter Savannah are both married. So there's my amazing extra children now. So, and as Sue mentioned, I recently became a grandma. I am very, very excited. Uh, she's 21 months old. Her name is Lily Catherine, and it's Tyler's daughter, for those of you who know Tyler. Um, there is a picture of her, I think, somewhere. There she is. <laughs> she just lights up a room when she comes in, and when people ask me, Terry, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm a grandma. Life is amazing. He was like, what else is there? <laughs> so, and those of you who are grandmas, that you understand how full my heart is. <laughs> That's for sure. I love how she is always like, she says, Mir, Mir, which means come here. Um, she wants you to follow her and she'll take off running, but then she turns to make sure that you are actually following uh, so that you can chase her wherever she's going or she pats the floor and wants you to come and sit down right beside her. And oh, it's such a joy. So I love it. Our theme today is seen and heard by God. That's what we're talking about. My granddaughter, Lily, she wants to be seen and heard. And she's not even two years old yet. Uh, I was talking recently to my daughter, and she said, Mom, I just want somebody to know me, to really understand me, to really get me. And she's 26. Uh, I believe God puts that in all of our hearts, that we want to feel like we're seen and heard, that we matter, that we are loved, that we're here for a reason. I think God puts that in us. Um, the story in Genesis 16, uh, we're going to uh, look at that. That's where you see a great example of how Jesus, I mean, God sees and hears us. I'm gonna just kind of tell the story. Uh, Sarah, married to Abraham, Desperately wants to have a baby, but so far is unable to get pregnant. She decides that she's going to help God out because she's impatient and she wants a baby. So that's not the scripture yet that we'll get to. Um, do you ever feel like that? That, you know, come on, God, you know, and that we're tempted to want to help him. So Sarah comes up with a plan. She gives her servant girl to her husband, hoping that she could produce a child for Sarah to raise. 
I'm like, I can't even imagine. <laughs> but anyway, that's what she does. So Hagar, the servant girl, gets pregnant, and then she begins to despise Sarah. Well, Sarah's jealous, and she gets mad at Abraham, and she begins to mistreat Hagar. The crazy thing is, is, but Sarah, this was your idea <laughs> all along. Well, Hagar runs away. And the thing is, is when we try to take things into our own hands, it never works out as good as if God does it. So this is a verse that I want to read. Um, in Hagar running away. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarah, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. So God saw her struggle. He saw the way she was being mistreated, and he actually appeared to her. He didn't promise to take away all of her struggles. This is real life. But he did promise to bring about incredible good in her life, that her descendants would increase to be too numerous to even count. In verse 13, so she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That all along, God was watching over her. He had a plan for her. Later, in Genesis 21, God gives Sarah a son that he had promised to her 25 years earlier. So, you ever have to wait for a prayer to be answered? <laughs> Sarah understood that. But God always comes through with what he promises, even though sometimes we have to wait quite a while. So Abraham and Sarah named their son Isaac. And later on, Abraham throws a feast to celebrate uh, Isaac being weaned. As they're celebrating, Sarah sees Ishmael, Hagar's son, making fun of the situation, making fun of Isaac. And that makes Sarah mad. So she goes to Abraham and demands that Abraham send him away. I hear a theme here. <laughs> Rather than dealing with the situation, Sarah wants to get rid of it. So she wants to just ignore it. Well, this distresses Abraham because Ishmael is still his son. Um, but God actually speaks to Abraham and reassures him. And he says, I myself will take care of Ishmael and provide for him. So the next day, Abraham sends him off, gives him food and water, and sends him away. So Hagar and Ishmael wander in the desert. And eventually, their water supply runs out. So in the desert, no water. Hagar leaves her son under a bush and walks away and begins to sob desperately. She thinks they're going to die. And God, again, sends an angel to speak to her and says, Do not be afraid. God has heard your cries. God heard her in this situation, and he sent an angel to provide for them. God valued Hagar even when the people in her life did not. Think about that. There are times when we have felt that. God still valued her and took care of her. God is always watching over us, even when we don't 
feel it sometimes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In Romans 8, verses 28 and 29, a lot of you probably know this verse by heart, it says that God promises that anything we go through in this broken, sinful world, he will use for our good. And he'll use it to mold and shape us more and more into the likeness of Jesus, which is what all Christians want. And the amazing thing is, is that the more we become like Jesus, really the better quality of life we have. You know, we're more loving, we're more patient, we're more kind, we're more self-controlled. Um, but we also have a greater influence on other people. So God will use whatever we go through. He does not waste our pain. And he will help to refine us to be more and more like Jesus. <coughs> Struggles are a part of life. We know that. But God sees us and he will send us help. Years ago, and some of you know this story, years ago, my sister was actually murdered by her husband. I was devastated, <laughs> changed my life forever. Um, and my mom had died six weeks earlier from health complications. And so it was a very challenging time in my life. My father had actually committed suicide when I was 11. So all of a sudden, my sister is gone in a very tragic way, and both my parents are gone. I felt like I was living in a nightmare for a while, just barely able to breathe was how it felt. Um, we went to court to get, try to get custody of my sister's baby. He was 19 months old at the time. And the custody issue was considered a different issue, like a civil issue, different compared to the murder issue. So even though my brother-in-law was in prison for murder, he had the most say-so over who, where the baby would go. Because he had rights as the father, and the mother, my sister, the judge said, had no rights because she was unavailable. And I'm thinking, unavailable? <laughs> but that's what the judge said. So we did not get custody of her baby. So it was a very painful, confusing time of my life. And I know some of you really understand that, that some of you have experienced really intense times like this. During this painful time, all I could do was hang on to a thread of faith that God was good. Nothing made sense. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to pray. I, don't, I can barely breathe. But I believed God was good. Somehow, I just held on to that thought. felt like that's all I could think. Um, and sometimes when things are really hard like that, we have to let the Bible guide us over our feelings. Faith has to guide us in those dark places. Because even in those dark places, God sees us and hears us. Well, later on, God completely changed that story, and I won't go into all the details, but we did get custody of her son. And God gave me the opportunity, I felt like, to do something really special for my sister for the rest of my life, that I could love and raise her son as my own. And I think about that so often that... Um, God chose me to get to love him. Um, so now I can look back and see so many good things that have come. Of course, in the moment, you can't say that. But now I can look back and I can tell hundreds of stories of ways God has worked. I get to raise my sister's son. He's 33 years old now and doing great. Um, God's grace, and it's only God's grace, has enabled me to completely forgive my brother-in-law, to let go of any kind of animosity or anger or pain. Um, and I 
tell people that is God's grace, that God enabled me to do that. And when we do that, it sets us free. You know, my brother-in-law changed my life forever, but if I don't forgive, I ruin my life. And God can do that in our hearts. He can give us that healing power. Um, I could tell so many stories about my brother-in-law's family, how, of course, you know, that was my sister's family. This, you know, this child is their relative. Um, how God melded us all together. And really, I mean, holidays and birthdays and anniversaries and funerals, we've been together. Um, it's so incredible. And several members of his family have reached out to me over the years and thanked me for the way that we've taken care of Remington, is his name, and, oh, it's just incredible. My brother-in-law actually wrote me a letter from prison telling me he's sorry for what he's done and thanking me for loving and taking care of his child. God works in amazing ways. God has really refined my character over the years, too, that through all of that, I mean, pain has a way of doing that, helping you to grow in humility and perseverance and patience and peace. Uh, And there's many times that it could happen no other way, that I can look back now through all the pain and tears and say, I wouldn't change it because of how different I am and because of the amazing miracles I've watched over the years in what God has done in so many people's lives. Um, and God wants us to know that we're seen and heard by him. And there are many scriptures that describe people crying out to God um, and he hears them and provides for them. Uh, he desires to equip us and give us what we need and through his word, through the Holy Spirit, and through each other. We help each other. Um, our job is to draw near to him and let him help us. Um, a growing issue of concern all around us today, and COVID actually multiplied it, is that of mental and emotional health. Um, Whether it's our struggle or someone we love, we've probably all been touched by it in some way or another. Well, God cares how we feel and how we're doing, and he wants to help us navigate through that kind of a challenge to heal from it and to learn to rise above it. That's what God can do. Um, With God, there's always hope. He promises Christians that he will always be with us. And I know some of us may be tempted to think, yeah, maybe he's working in your life, but I don't see it in mine. You know, sometimes we feel that way. And I know sometimes it's just plain hard. (laughs) And yet, one thing that I have seen that tends to make it hard to see God working in our lives and is also a common theme I see in the women that I counsel is insecurity. Insecurity in believing how God feels about them and how they feel about themselves. The reasons may be different as far as why we feel that way, but the thoughts and feelings and struggles are the same, that we can struggle to believe that God really, really loves us, that he loves us unconditionally. And the challenge is those thoughts affect how we feel which eventually affect our body. The better we get at learning how to catch those thoughts and control them, the more we'll grow in our confidence and our security and just being comfortable in our own skin, um, knowing that we are special to God, that we find our identity and our worth in who he says we are. Think of this. Do you ever say or think something like this? This is so hard. This is never going to change. I don't know if I can do this. 
I should be over this by now. What if that happens? God is probably disappointed in me again. Does God really love me? Am I doing enough? Am I enough? I believe God can do anything, but will he do it in my life? Do you ever feel anxious but don't even really know why? Do you feel the need to be validated or appreciated by people? The same way that Satan put doubt into Eve's head back in the very beginning in Genesis 3, did God really say you can't eat that fruit? He still puts those subtle doubts into our heads today, uh, which contribute to our feelings or our thoughts that question our self-worth, our self-esteem, our identity, our value to God. Our thoughts are the key. Thoughts are actually like a command to our subconscious that we need to be careful about what we say, especially out loud, you know, besides what we think in our head, because words can be very convincing to us. Changing the way that we communicate with ourselves changes our self-concept and our confidence faster than anything else will. Um, There's a scripture that has really helped me over the years when I was healing from the tragedies of my life. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, um, this one phrase, take captive your thoughts and make them obedient to Christ. Think about what, what that means, to take it captive, to take hold of it and push it out. You know, when I would be afraid of that next phone call. When is it somebody else? When is it one of my children? When is it my husband? That fear of facing that kind of pain again, whenever I would feel that fear, I would take hold of it. No, I'm not gonna live in fear. Push it out and replace it with a Bible truth. God is with me. God loves me. Um, Another scripture, (coughs) excuse me, that has meant so much to me over the years, Philippians 4, 8. And I'm sure most of you can quote it. Think about things that are good and true and noble and right, that God wants us to dwell on all that's good. We can't control the thoughts that come into our heads, but we can learn to control the thoughts that stay there. You know, God is our greatest counselor and psychologist that will ever be. And our Christian ancestors have been on this journey of mental and emotional health for thousands of years. And God sees, he hears, he cares. Another thing that we can control is what we fill our minds with every day. You know, um, God's word, great conversations with friends, good things, Or is it social media and the news? I mean, those things right there can drive us crazy. Um, Or just ruminating over all the things that are not going well. If you do that very long, your emotions are going down. Um, Satan doesn't let up. And he puts those negative thoughts in our head and we say them to ourselves a lot more than we actually realize. And these thoughts, affect our mental and emotional health. It's good for us to share those thoughts with a close friend, to get it out so that they can help us hear it and deal with it, so that it doesn't stick, so that it doesn't stay in. We're not trying to fix one another, we're trying to support and help one another. God is not offended by those thoughts. He wants to help us. He wants us to wrestle with them so that we can find peace. He knows how we're wired. He created us. Uh, He wants us to feel secure in the fact that he loves us. 
Recently, I called one of my spiritual mentors, Debbie Wright. Um, some of you remember Brittany Sherwood that was here for a while. That's her mother. Debbie's the one who studied the Bible with me. I was actually baptized 43 years ago before some of you were born. <laughs> so, and I am so grateful for all of those years. Um, I called Debbie for her advice because I felt really stuck in grief um, and just couldn't seem to get past it. Um, in the last year and a half in Charleston, we've lost six of our members along or in addition to all of our members who've lost loved ones. And so it's affected all of us. Um, I teach grief workshops and have walked very closely alongside several of those friends. And my tendency can be to absorb how others feel and carry it with me. Um, so I was feeling very heavy, very overwhelmed, very depressed, really. And so I called Debbie and I said, Debbie, I should be able to get over this. And think about that statement even, I should. You know, what do you hear that's wrong with it? And Debbie heard it. And she said, Terry, that is a demonic accusatory statement from Satan. It's not from God. And I actually started laughing because that's what I do every day to help other people. But I didn't hear it in myself. And I was like, oh. Hmm, I believe that. <laughs> you know, Debbie heard it, and it was contributing to me feeling stuck because I kept saying negative things to myself about how I felt. Um, I'm so glad I called her because she heard things coming out of my mouth that were not from God. Um, she's not a counselor. She's a spiritual trusted friend, and she helped me sort out my thoughts and get rid of the faithless ones. And I felt the weight begin to lift. And oh, I was so, so thankful. I know some of us are not used to having those kind of conversations, we're not used to sharing our thoughts with someone else and being gut level real. I wasn't either until literally I joined a church like this in Indiana and started getting to know spiritual women. And I'm so Thankful. They taught me how to get in touch and how to be able to sort it out. Um, God wants all of us to have those kind of relationships because we need them. We need each other. And ask him to guide you to those safe women, and he will. Another awesome, awesome scripture is Romans 12, 2 that says, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that that's how our life changes. It starts in our mind. And much of the mental health battle today is in our thoughts. And I'm definitely not saying that all of it is because I know there's a physical component to it, but our thoughts do matter. So when you or a loved one is struggling with emotional or mental issues, it's important to validate how they feel, and encourage and support their efforts to work with their medical doctor. The part we can help each other with is the spiritual, mental side of things. That we can help each other hear the words that we're saying to each other that are negative and help each other to learn how to replace those thoughts with good so that the fear, the worry, the anxiety, the pain doesn't control us. You know, stress and fear are a part of life. We feel it, but our goal is to learn how to give it to God and not let it consume us. A sad but true story. A teenager in Charleston that I know used to write on her bathroom mirror in either a red marker or red lipstick, I am a waste of air. I am worthless. I'm never enough. And about 10 things like that. So if she got ready for school every day, 
That's what she read. Soon, she started struggling with depression. And then, anxiety. And then, panic attacks. And now, she's literally struggling with psychosomatic seizures. Her body is literally seizing, but there's no physical medical reason why. They're psychosomatic. And <clears throat> the worst thing of all is that she won't let anyone talk to her about spiritual things. So her suffering is intense. And it all started with those negative thoughts that she said to herself. And She's a beautiful, talented young woman. Um, God sees her. He hears her. He cares about her. And he longs for her to reach out to him. It's what I pray for every time I think about her. A couple ways we can help each other and help ourselves. In Matthew 6, 34, this is in the message translation. It's talking about not worrying about tomorrow. Give your attention, entire attention, to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. God's calling us to live in today. Think about this. When we dwell on the past, the hurt, the trauma, the mistakes we've made, the frustrations, the guilt, the regrets, when we dwell on those things, and they're real, they're all there, I know, when we dwell on them, it can become like a ball and chain wrapped around our ankle that we're dragging with us. Then what happens to today? Think about that. If you're so focused on what I wish I hadn't done or what didn't happen, you lose today. Or if we dwell on all the, well, what if that happens? We worry about tomorrow. We get so afraid of tomorrow. I was so afraid of that next phone call that I would face pain again that I parented out of anxiety. Don't touch that. Don't do that. No, you can't. You know, I really had to fight to deal with the fear so that I could relax and live in today and just enjoy my kids instead of freaking them out. <laughs> um, dwelling on the past feeds depression. Worrying about the future feeds anxiety. We've got to keep working on asking God to help us heal from the past. God, heal it, erase it, fix it, show me what to do with it. And trust that he's in control of tomorrow. He'll be there. He's in charge. So that we can focus on today and go have a good day. That's what God wants for us. Another example of how we can help ourselves and help each other, this thought does God really love me? Is he really pleased with me right now, today? Our identity is not wrapped up in the results or the performance of our life. He loves us unconditionally and completely accepts us. He proved that on the cross. That Jesus died for us before we cared, before we understood, before we knew. And if you've never studied that out, get with someone and do it together to right away. Um, because we've got to learn how to take God at his word. To not read something and say, yes, but. We've got to believe that that message is personal. It's real. Another thing that if something doesn't go well that you're doing, all you got to learn to do is try again. It's not a reflection of your worth, which is sometimes how we feel. There's nothing we can mess up that God 
can't fix. You know, as women, we desire to work hard and do a good job and be effective and take care of other people. We're, we tend to be nurturers. That's how God um, wired us, at least many of us, um, that we want to be responsible and hardworking and caring. And all of those things are good. They're strengths that God put in you. Um, you want to be a, good at what you do, whether it's your job or being a wife or being a mom or being a friend or being a sister. And the problem comes in, and the way Satan tries to use those strengths against you is when you allow those desires to be tied to your identity, your worth, your confidence, your self-esteem. You take it personally if someone gets upset with you. You feel down on yourself if something doesn't go well. And you begin to worry that God's not pleased with you. And you can easily start feeling like, I'm not enough. And you can dwell on the past mistakes instead of enjoying today. God says, you are loved, you are perfect, you are enough at this very moment. If you are covered with Christ, which is what Galatians 3.27 says, when God looks at you, he sees Christ. And Christ is perfect. So you look perfect to God. You are his precious child, his favorite princess. I think that's what all of you should feel, that I'm God's favorite. That that's how God wants you to feel. That he believes in you and always wants the very best for you. Study this out if you're not convinced that you are covered with Christ. Yes, we'll keep learning and growing the rest of our lives. We know we're not perfect. But God gave us Jesus' righteousness when we became a Christian so that we look perfect to God. When our confidence comes from that, it makes all the difference in the world. So to wrap up, a powerful way that we can help ourselves and others is helping each other to refute Satan's lies and the ways that he accuses us and replace it with God's truth because God's word is our greatest power source. God saw Hagar. He heard her. He cared about how she felt and what she needed, and he provided for her. He blessed her out of the, the tragedy that she experienced. God sees us and hears us, and he longs to be gracious to us. What are you going to do today to let God in at a deeper level? And who... Will you get to help you? Because we are all seen and heard by God. Thank you.